Hello Year 5, welcome to your history lesson for today. So we're going to pick up from where we left off last week when we were looking at what everyday life was like for a Mayan. Now, some of you did this work last week, some of you did not send the work in to me. So I have a couple of snippets of some people's work that I've managed to put on the PowerPoint and some of the other people's work that I've done. Just because the photos were a little bit blurry, I've added that information into our lesson. So effectively, some of you have actually done most of my planning for me today to put this PowerPoint together already. So well done to those of you that did the history lesson from last week. Anyone that might have missed that lesson or didn't have a go at it, now's your opportunity to be able to catch up in this lesson. So... Let's have a look at Mayan houses, okay? Now, there's usually only one main house for the family, okay? And if there's any areas where they'll go and do any cooking, they actually build a separate house that would be next door, primarily just for them to be able to cook, because obviously the main house is their living space. Now, you might notice from this photo, if you look closely, the Mayan house is actually shaped as an oval shape. Now, that if they did them... Uh, in a squared shape or a rectangle shape, when they put the roof on, there'd be gaps at the edges, which would allow water to get through and obviously would then create leaks. So the reason why they were oval shaped was actually as the thatched roof gets put on, it joins all the way round in one big continuous circle, meaning that each part overlaps the next part as it goes along, which means that there's no holes, so it doesn't allow any of that water or anything to leak through. Now a thatched part of the roof is actually called the palapa. OK, and that's what they call that thatched roof on their house. It's usually made of grass and palms and you can see they're usually dried out. What will happen is they'll stitch them together with rope or string that's then pulled tight and then they're effectively attached onto the top and then wrapped again with string or something secure to keep it into place. Now, the houses, let's just move my beautiful face. So the houses are built on a foundation of rocks, first of all. So they've got to flatten the land, OK? And then the wooden posts are then put up and added to form that frame. So that's that wall that goes all the way around the outside. Now, to make sure that those stay secure and stay in their place, they have smaller stumps of wood, so logs, that are then attached and nailed around the edge horizontally. OK, so all of the other bars will be put all the way along like that, OK, vertically. And then one set of the log will be placed around the middle of it and nailed together to hold those foundations in place. Now. Something actually that Rhea found out, so I've got a copy of some of the work that she did here, that the walls were covered in a daub-like mixture made with clay. Now we know that from the Tudor times that you would use wattle and daub, where they'd actually fill in those gaps from the beams. And you can see here an example of that house where they've actually used a form of plaster. So they've used the daub and clay mixture and then they've added some grass into it that makes that thick compounded, um, compact, sorry, uh, plaster that goes around the outside. And obviously then they can paint it with a whitewash, okay? And that almost makes it more secure. It doesn't let in as much of the air or let out as much of the heat. So that's a more enclosed shape on the house. Now even Rhea's put in here, the traditional mine houses are made from wood and they can be rectangular, okay? And the reason why they have a thatched roof, okay, so obviously they don't get the leaks in there as well. But obviously we also know that pyramids and temples are then built on higher platforms. So actually the common houses are built on very flat land, but down on the soil. So they're not raised up off the floor to prevent from any leaks. Now, an interesting thing that I actually didn't know, so thank you to Rhea for this one, though it's going to give me nightmares, I'm not sure I wanted to know this, that for extra insulation, so we know when we looked at that video of insulation where they sprayed it onto the walls and it expanded with the heat, obviously that insulation traps the heat into the house, and that's what we all have in between the walls of our house to keep that heat in. Well, they wouldn't have that type of insulation, but what they would do is they would bury the dead people in the floor. I'm not quite sure how that keeps them nice and warm. If anything, that must have been the most disgusting smell I think I could possibly even imagine. But apparently that's something that they used to do. So thank you and not thank you for that fact, Rhea, because that's going to haunt me, especially when you say it's a tradition. That's, that's, me, that's a tradition I don't think I want to be involved in. But thank you for that very interesting fact. So we've seen the example of where we've got the tree trunks that are built around in the circle. Here we've got some more of the modern day examples that Rhea talks about, which are the more traditional houses. But rather than building with them, building them with logs, they'd be made with wooden planks. So those planks would be built, okay, as the external framework, and then the thatch roof would be attached to the top. Now here you can see where they've added on the new thatch, okay, that goes along the top, and it's been secured with these two almost bamboo-like poles here, where they've been able to wrap it and attach it to the top 
part to then allow it to hang, okay? So these would have been made slightly differently where they've been made with the wooden panels. Now inside, okay, they usually had just the one large open room. Okay, this is why the kitchen room would have built, built, been built next door in a different part of the house. So here you can see they've got one open room and here they've got different storage that's been hung from the, from the sides here of the beams. Now that would be used for personal use or to store food. Now one thing we're going to learn about is that actually a lot of their food was quite fresh. So they never really felt the need to store food, okay, because it would be, it would be cooked fresh and then eaten. So there's not really much left for them to store. And then here you can see it in a more modern setting here. Okay, so they would have hung hammocks, okay, from one side to the other to allow for bed space and obviously more floor space. And here they have actually got a chest of drawers or a bureau here that's allowed them to store some clothing, okay. So you can see that actually it's quite, it's quite plain inside. And here you can see the, the traditional oval shaped one with those pines, with the logs. You can see lots of the gaps in between. So you can understand why they build that daub paste with the clay and the, and the grass to always fill in those gaps. So that's looking at Mayan houses. So well done for Ria for that. You did a lovely piece of work on that for me. So you did most of my work for me on that one. Thank you very much. Along with creeping me out just a little bit. Now we're going to have a look at Mayan clothes. Okay, now I know there was a couple of you that did the Mayan clothes and they came through, but your pictures were a teeny tiny bit blurry. So I've actually pulled some of the work you did off your spider diagram and I've added it on here. Now their clothes are made of several kinds of plants. Okay, and what they would do is they would spin spin that material and they turn it into thread and cloth now the two common plants they had was cotton okay and cotton plants basically look like cotton wool which you will know miss humphrey just cannot stand in the slightest so i'm not going to look at that picture and then we have magui here now this almost looks like one of our cacti plants okay and they used to use a lot of the tougher the tougher skins on the outside of these plants for their clothes as well but they also had resources to be able to dye their own clo clothes with plant and animal sources. Now, the most common colours that they would be able to get from plants, which is almost a natural source of dye, as well as animals as well, was blue, green, purple and black. And they were able to get a variation of different types of reds. Okay. Now, not only could they dye their clothes and use different types of materials to gain that colour and that texture, but they'd also embroider their clothes as well. So they'd stitch patterns in. Um, they'd fray the ends so that it's, um, they had almost like tassels on it or they'd knot certain parts of the material. Now, women tended to wear a complicated hairstyle. So they'd have a very intricate, very, um, very complicated hairstyle where all their hair would be up. Or they would wear a sort of a turban-like headdress, okay? Now, men also wore turban-like headdresses, sometimes made of feathers and gems and animal skin. Now, here we can see a little girl here who's wearing a traditional headwear. So you can see how it's adorned here, okay, with all of the, the different types of feathers. And here is an old picture from our archaeologist's findings from one of the Mayan temples of a Mayan king. Now, he's wearing a headdress here that's adorned with blue feathers. I wonder if any of you can remember, what does it mean when something is adorned? We did this in reading last week. Good means decorated. Well done. Okay, so it was decorated with blue feathers, okay? So here you've got your traditional headwear. And this is more of the very outrageous, very elegant, very big headdress that the Mayan king would wear. So clothing for men and women was obviously slightly different. Let's move my beautiful face over here. So men would tend to wear what's called a loincloth. Oh, so that's going to be this gentleman here. So it's a simple piece of material that's wrapped around the waist repeatedly and then it's wrapped down and between the legs. So it almost creates almost like a half skirt, half pant kind of idea, almost like trousers. So that would sit tightly around their waist and down from their legs. Now, if they were upper class men, they would have their loincloth decorated with feather work. OK, so this would make them more superior. So here you can see as we look at our warriors, obviously, you've got the tribal print that's on them. And then here you can see from the priest and the king, it's decorated OK, with rich material, along with the additional uh, jewellery and shoulder decoration and their headdresses that they used to wear as well. Now, they had a piece of material that was called a patty. This was a big square piece of cloth that was decorated and they'd wear it sort of over their shoulders, a bit like a poncho. So you know that big thing that you put, you put over the top of your head and it almost like covers you front and back. Now, the interesting thing about that is it wasn't just something they'd wear at daytime as well, they'd wear it at nighttime. But they actually used the, the different types of decoration to differentiate what their class was, so what their role was in society. Now, women would wear something that was very, very long. They'd have a sleeveless poncho or top, okay, which they'd wear on the top, or they'd wear a dress. 
Um, and they'd either have it tied around their waist with a belt or they'd have it tied in a knot. So here we can see this lady, I'm not sure you can see it, she's actually got it tucked in a special way where it tucks in at the side of her. Now if they were the upper class women, they would wear clothing which would be decorated with fringes and knots. So that's at the end where it would be slightly frayed, okay, so they'd have highly decorated clothing but would be slightly different so here you can see an example of the girls here wearing the poncho okay so it's almost something that doesn't have sleeves but it's a sheet of material that sits over the top of you okay so different styles of clothing there for men and women so let's have a look at the minecraft okay and i know a couple of people did the minecraft and again i've just pinpointed some of the things you came up with so here we've got an example of a pottery incense burner now incense burner if anyone's ever had them um, they, they come in lots of different ways, but they almost burn like special sticks or cones that give off a very rich certain smell that obviously fills an aroma of the room. A bit like uh, if you were to like, spray your room with nice, nice room spraying, an incense burner does the same thing, but it's something that burns and it creates that aroma, so that rich smell. Now they used to burn a tree resin called copal, okay? Now it was actually used during religious ceremonies, and this one here particularly, if you look very closely, it's actually shaped like a porcupine. So porcupine is almost like a giant form of the family of someone with uh, of a hedgehog, okay? So porcupines have that have those really long black and white spines. You might have seen them if you've ever been to the zoo or been to the farm. Um, very, very long spikes um, and quills. They're called quills, okay? And the smoke would actually come out here from the animal's mouth here. So the incense would be put inside, it'd be set alight, and obviously it would then be put out, and it's the smoke, okay, that gives off that aroma. And then it almost looks like that it's smoke that's coming out of that animal's mouth. Now here we've got another piece of pottery. So this is a pottery figurine of a woman, okay, and she's dressed in the typical style at that time. One thing they found just from looking at their pottery was actually here, as you can see, she's got a flattened forehead, which was actually quite a common thing for them to do in those times because it was seen as a sign of beauty. So when babies were born, they'd actually wrap their foreheads very tightly, almost to flatten it. So in those days, that was a style of being beautiful. Like nowadays, you see the different changes of what people's eyebrows should look like, where people have got very thin eyebrows, then big bushy eyebrows, and it fits with the time. In those times, it was the shape of your forehead that considered you as being beautiful or not. And here we can see an example of a jade plaque. This is actually worn as a brooch. And it's actually an inscribed image of a king that's sitting down and praying. Okay. So they use lots of different materials in their Minecraft, as well as using pottery skills to make things like musical instruments as well, which I know we looked at in a previous lesson. Now, here we have our Mayan children. Okay, I think this is Bethany's work that she's done on here. It was a nice clear picture. No, it's not Bethany. I beg your pardon. This is Maya's work. Uh, oh. Sophia's work, it's Sophia's work. Um, this was a nice clear picture, so I've included this one on here. Now, boys and girls had different roles, okay? Girls would have um, the role of helping with cooking. They'd be weaving along with materials and making clothes as well as making the crafts. Boys, on the other hand, would learn how to hunt. They'd learn to fish. They'd learn to farm the land, so to grow the crops and to wean them and to grow them and to turn them into other things. But they'd also be shown how to make weapons and tools. So not only weapons to be able to fight, but weapons that they might need to hunt, okay, or to cook. Um, so they would learn how to make those different things as well. Now, you can see here that girls wore a tunic. I say So a tunic is almost like a long dress, where boys would wear a loincloth, which is what we looked at in our previous one. Now, their life is very different to the life that you have, okay? Their houses didn't have windows. They'd eat and sleep and work all day long. So they had jobs, unlike you guys, you come to school. Obviously, only rich boys went to school in those days, okay? So as girls, you weren't even considered as going to school. Your job was to be at home and you were to help with the house chores, okay? Which is quite similar in a lot of other cultures, especially when we've looked at, like, Tudor life and when you've done the Egyptians. It was common for the women and the girls to stay at home and run the house, now, the boys actually got to be able to go to school and obviously they had very simple clothing. They didn't have lots of money, okay? Um, and at some point in time when um, girls became of a certain age, they'd be able to get married, okay? So obviously that's something that becomes a cultural thing as well.